Hello, I'm Tara Wheeler Van Vlack, and this is the four step plan to break into tech. Tech is kind of scary for a lot of people. It's intimidating, and if you feel like you haven't been raised into tech, it can be a very intimidating career field to get into. It's much easier than you think it is. I'm going to break this down into four simple steps. Before I do that, let me tell you that I'll be doing a live version of this talk tonight at the Hack the People Portland Mentor Night Meetup, and that's going to be downtown tonight starting at, I believe, 6.30 at New Relic. You can find it on meetup.com, and we would love to have you there. I will also be doing a longer four-night version of this in Seattle in two weeks for persons who are transitional, who need a little help, who are stuck in dead-end jobs or are under or unemployed at the moment. I look forward to being able to help you and work with you on a longer-term basis. So let's get this started. The four-step plan. Let us talk about who it is that makes a good technologist. A good technologist is anybody. If you're a curious person, if you enjoy the world, if you enjoy finding out why things work, you are fit and suited to be a techie. You can get into technology. So who makes a good technologist? As an example, a 50-year-old man who's just spent 30 years of his life in precision manufacturing and who no longer has a job would make an excellent technologist. Somebody who is precise, who is careful, who has enjoyed working on a team and who takes directions well and who's very careful about safety would be an excellent QA or web tester. The kind of person who enjoys work that can be at, on occasion repetitive until you innovate from that repetition to something that needs human beings is the kind of person who will really enjoy technological work. Uh, somebody who's in sales is going to involve the kind of, of understanding of how to serve a client that someone on the inside of a tech company needs to be a product or a project manager. You're suited to do it. Someone who has a dead-end job and no college degree, but who likes picking up tasks on the side, who likes to rebuild a car engine on the weekends, who enjoys figuring out new and innovative ways to build birdhouses. You, you're a techie. You're already one. You just don't know it yet. The skill set is the same. If you like creating things, inventing things, and finding out how things work, a computer is just a different tool to do it with. No degree matters a lot less in technology than you might think it does. I don't have any degrees in computer science. I don't have a degree in business, and yet I'm an entrepreneur and a CEO of a startup. So how did this happen? Most people in technology, especially the ones who really enjoy it, came into tech sideways. We have degrees in music, in art, in international relations, in political science. We've got the kind of degrees that help people understand things, and we've always enjoyed taking stuff apart and putting it back together again. So a lack of a computer science degree doesn't bar you. In fact, maybe technology is the last bastion, or maybe a new creation of, of people who skipped going to college altogether and decided they just wanted to get their hands dirty. Authors, musicians, artists, they all tend to like technology a great deal. You'll find computer programmers in bands, and you'll find musicians who program on the side. Music, math, and technology are closely interrelated. So the other demographic I like to point out is single mothers often make extremely good technologists. The reason for that is they're very good at organization. I like to think that technology is uniquely open to women who are in a constrained career path because they've got children or family or carer issues that they need to work with. Technology will bend around you and be a great career because it's well-paying, it's prestigious, and if you can do the job, no one cares if you do it at 3 o'clock in the morning in your pajamas. So you are a technologist as soon as you start programming, and if you're someone who has to work around family, this is the place to be. So number two, so the, really the first step is just believe it. Believe that you can do it. The second step is going to be side projects. How do you learn to get in tech, into technology? And this is going to be an interesting one. I anticipate some questions on this. Remember that as we're going through here, you're also able to use the little question and answer application in Google Hangouts to ask me questions. I'll notice them when I open that up when I start the, um, the Q&A portion of this in about 10 to 12 minutes. Ask me all the questions that you want to, and you can upvote when other people ask you questions. 
So side projects. How do you learn to get into technology? You just start doing it. When I became a web developer was the day that I opened up, I think it was Notepad on a Windows machine, so this has been a while. Uh, I opened up Notepad and I viewed source on some web page that I'd gone to. And I looked at it, and it just looked like weird text to me. But I saw a piece of text that I recognized from looking at the page from before. I saw it said something like, you know, click here to go to the next screen. And I saw those words on that page of text that I copied over into the notepad. And I looked at it, and then I changed those words from click here to go into the next page to Tara says hi, or something like that. Then I saved the file instead as page.html and opened it up in Internet Explorer. And lo and behold, the words that I put there were on that page instead of the words that the other people had put there. From that moment, I would started writing HTML. I would started making it so that I could figure out how to build the Internet instead of just participating in it. As soon as you start doing that with any programming language, you are a beginning programmer. Don't tell yourself, oh, I've done a little bit of programming, so I'm not a real programmer. Tell yourself that you're starting out and that you're going to learn everything you possibly can. Here's how to make side projects work for you. You need to define what it is that you can do. A good way to go about this, especially if you're someone who feels intimidated by technology, is to pick a programming language and then a skill set and then start working in that space. Find a programming language, and I'm going to suggest for many of you folks who are brand new to technology that you choose either HTML or Python. HTML is the language that the internet is written in. It's the, the things that you see on web pages, those are encoded in HTML. And that's what I changed the first day that I became a web developer. Um, you learn how to make stuff appear on a web page. The other language that I will recommend is Python. Python is very easy for beginners to get into, and I, am, I will almost guarantee you that within 20 miles of you anywhere in the United States is a Python meetup group of some kind. It's very friendly, open, and welcome to, to outsiders. You show up, and someone will tell you how to write a Hello World Python script, and then you're, you're a Python developer. That's the language that you use. Now, what do you do with it? The other thing you do is choose a skill set. The two easy ways to get a, 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 an entry level, what we call an entry level job in technology, is to be a web tester or a quality assurance person. What this means is that you're finding the mistakes that other people have made on web pages or helping to clean up code that other people have written. This is, it's, it's the very, um, the very kind of the lowest hanging fruit. That's, you, that's your entry into technology. So what you want to do, for instance, is to start learning the language and the skill set of being a Python quality assurance engineer. What you would do is go to your local Python group and get started learning to program. It's not that scary. It's interesting. Think of it like jigsaw puzzles or like a crossword puzzle. If you like puzzles and games, you're going to be fine learning Python. A lot of the time, it just looks like you're writing down English. And if you've ever gotten familiar with the fact that math or French or American Sign Language are all just symbolically different ways to represent the English language, then you're going to be just fine with Python or HTML. It's just a different way to say English. Put this image here is image SRC in HTML. That's all that it is. And in Python, it's similar. After a while, you just get used to manipulating the symbols. It really is just puzzles. After you've done that, what you should do is go to a website called GitHub. Go to GitHub, start an account, and then try to use your newfound skills to help other people improve their code. Pick a great open source project. If you don't know what open source is, go look it up and you'll find out why. And submit something we like to call a pull request. The only thing that you might want or need to do in your very first pull request is just fix a typo. You might see that someone has committed a, a line of code where at the end they've misspelled the word program. If the only thing you do in your very first pull request is just fix a typo, and you'll understand how to do this as you go forward, you have done your very first pull request on GitHub, and you show that you made a positive commitment and contribution to something that a lot of people care about, which is freely available software on the internet. People like me are thrilled to see that. I'm constantly recruiting people for our company, Fizzmint, which is HR automation. I care a lot about whether or not people who are becoming part of Fizzmint 
uh, care about the communities and develop the kinds of, of technologies that we work with every day at FISMIT. So pick that skill and keep going. After a while, you'll find that your skill set will increase. You'll learn over time. The only way that you can learn this is by doing it. It's, that's the reason why your college degree doesn't matter as much. If you rack up 500 pull requests on Python, it, on, a, on a, an open source project, say something that helps people have access to the internet if they are um, learning disabled, I'll be thrilled. It looks like you'll become someone who's a lead contributor. Maybe contribute to the Django project, a web framework that a lot of people use. You start doing that, and you're developing a skill set that people will hire you for. The reason, the, the thing that I keep saying again and again is, is you have to demonstrate that you know what you can do. Because honestly, no one cares about your resume and technology. I ask for people to provide me with a two-line bio and their GitHub account when they come into FISMIT. I don't know that I've looked at a resume in years. I don't care. I care only what you can do, not what other people say you can do, but what you've shown that you can do. So that's your path. You've got it right there. You can follow it and get into tech that way. It, it's not a difficult process. Treat it like a puzzle that you're going to spend some time cracking. So the other part of that is GitHub is a communal project. You may choose something else to use, but I'll just recommend GitHub now. It's the biggest one that's out there. Part of what you're doing is you're making it so that other people can evaluate the quality of the work that you do. Other people's opinions on, their co on your code will affect my decision on whether or not I want to hire you or not. So make it so that people participate in, enjoy in, and, and can join in the things that you do online. And then I'll see that you've got a spectacular side project. Number three. This is the part where almost nobody believes me, and it's, it's kind of crazy. I've, I've had this conversation with dozens of 45-year-old single mothers. Your people skills matter more than anything else, and I will tell you how. The very first thing that we count on, that we depend on in technology, is that you do what you say you're going to do. You do what you say you're going to do, and then in the 10% of cases where it's not going to happen, you tell people. If you say, that by the end of the week you're going to have something done, have it done. If you can't get it done, tell people before the end of the week. You would be stunned at how many people I know who make 150 bucks an hour can't do this. If you're capable of doing this, you will climb quickly through the ranks of technology. The QA and web tester jobs that I know of in Seattle now start between $16 and $20 an hour. A couple of them are a smidge below what, we would, what we'll call minimum wage in Seattle, which is $15 an hour, or, or heading in that direction. But most of them are going to be $15, $16, $17 an hour. The next quick jump is to tester. If you can make it to tester and then start your progress up to software engineer in test, or software development in test, you're rocketing your way towards $100 an hour. Just doing what you say you're going to do is a huge proportion of that. And after that, that commitment to being responsible, to taking credit for it, taking responsibility for the things that you do, comes the big three C's when it comes to technology. And again, you'd be surprised at how many people can't do this. Are you somebody who can communicate with your team? Are you someone who is clear about what it is that you want. Do you say what you want in the email or do you assume that other people will understand what you mean? Writing good emails is a huge part of being a good technologist. If you're going to be a techie, you need to tell other people what it is that they're doing right and what it is that they're doing wrong. You have to be able to do so clearly. The second part of this, the second C, is are you compassionate? Do you understand what other people screw up? Do you want to help or do you want to blame them? Don't be someone who blames. Be someone who contributes to the kindness, the courtesy, and the compassion of the group that you're in. There's very competitive nature among people in technology, and if you can decrease the, the competitive nature of the group that you're in, the desire of people to win at coding, whatever that might mean, you're going to be a great asset to the people that you work with. Kindness is a hard thing to find in, in technology sometimes. And the more of it you have, the more valued you'll be as a company asset. And the third thing, can you cooperate? You would be stunned also at how many people want to be left alone and never talk to anybody in technology uh, when they program all day long. Most of the time, that's fine. But when you're working on a project with other people, are you someone who 
quickly acknowledges when you are to blame for something and lets other people give you the credit. Are you someone who is open and willing to hear constructive criticism? Will you stand up for yourself? But more than anything else, can you hear it when you've done something wrong and then improve from there? Be someone who's a good teammate, who is a, a cooperative person. It's, it must sound kind of funny. I'm giving you this four-step plan on, on how to get into technology, and the big emphasis I'm giving you is compassion and cooperation and communication. If you can demonstrate these traits and do so clearly, especially in the first couple of months of any new position, you're going to be at a huge advantage when it comes to promotions and getting new jobs, as well as having people remember you with fondness. And the reason for that is our fourth step, which is that you shouldn't be interviewing for your jobs in technology. Other people should be calling you up and asking you to be part of their company. Here's how this works. You can't get a job by applying anymore. I met somebody once. It was like a unicorn who, who applied for a job at Google through their web interface and got it. I have never heard of that at Amazon or at Microsoft. No one applies for jobs through a web interface, Taleo or whatever, and, and gets a job. It doesn't happen. Someone knows who you are and reaches out to you and says, are you interested in this, in this position? Before any job posting ever goes out, the job has been filled. It just doesn't happen. So once that has happened, you get that information that that job is available. The kind of effort it takes to maintain a good network in technology is minimal compared to the amount of benefit it brings you. Be good at networking. Here's how you do it. Someone has to introduce you for a job. You have to know someone at major companies who's interested in bringing you aboard or know someone who knows someone. So the first thing I'll suggest is on October the 1st I'm going to do a larger talk on this weekly broadcast with some special guests who are some of the greatest networkers I've ever met. They're people who understand that networking is about being kind to people, not about trying to find an advantage for yourself, but about trying to create something great for someone else and creating positive externalities for you. The only thing you're trying to do is help people, and then you get a reputation as somebody who's a kind person and someone who communicates well. That's how you get people to call you and want you to be part of their team. Here is the three meetup strategy on how to build your network in technology. You should be going to at least three meetings a month that let you meet new people and interact with them and improve your, your process in technology and how many people you know. The first thing you should do is in whatever major metropolitan area you're in, you should be in the tech meetup, the big one. In Portland, it's the Portland Tech Meetup. In Seattle, it's the Seattle Tech Meetup. Actually, now it has become New Tech Meetup or New Tech Seattle, I think. It's just been changed to a new name. In New York, it's the New York Tech Meetup. So whichever one that one is that has a thousand people, show up and per participate in the business card extravaganza. Collect the cards, connect with them on LinkedIn. Maybe make a couple of real personal connections. Show your face a few times and let people know what it is that you're looking for with a two-sentence spiel of what it is that you need. The next meetup you should be attending on a monthly basis at a minimum is a skill set one. If you're a Python developer, you should be going to and learning at your local Python meetup. The In Portland, I believe it's uh, Pig, possibly, or no, that's that's CPIG. That's the Seattle Python um, users group. In, in Portland, there's a, Port, uh, there's a Portland Python meetup. Whatever your skill set is, you should be going to that one and learning and improving and finding people to work on projects with. And finally, attend at least one mentoring or networking um, or, or personal accountability group on a monthly basis as well. A suggestion is your local Hack the People group. That is specifically set up for one-on-one -on -one and small group mentoring as well as accountability with each other and deeper connections in technology. You've either got one in your area or we'd love to have you start one. Hack the People is an important way to make sure that you get information and connections in technology and that you are developing your career over time. And the very last part of how to never interview again for tech is make it so that people can find you online. Tell people who you are and what you're doing on Twitter Make sure that you have a Twitter account so people can reach you and make it so someone can find you. If, you ha if your real name isn't being used on your GitHub project, if your real name isn't on your Twitter account, then I can't find you to hire you. And most jobs go to the people who are given a call about it. The next set of those jobs are given to someone who seems extremely well qualified. They're contacted out of the blue by people who work at that company and are invited to show up and interview. And that's how you get those positions. 
if someone cannot contact you through LinkedIn, through Twitter, if your email address is not available out there, we can't hire you. So make yourself easy to find and be responsive when people want to talk to you about your projects online. Okay, that is the four-step plan. Now I've got uh, several questions people have emailed me and there we go. We can start the question and answer portion now. If you'd like to ask, ask some questions, you can do so in the application. And I will pull up my Twitter account now to see how many people have decided to ask questions there. Um, shoot, how's, there we go. Let us get over to Twitter. I should have opened this up, but I'm at my mom's house down here in Portland visiting and without uh, my usual setup, I'm all confustimicated. So, there we go. All right, let's go ahead and start with a question that I received via email. Uh, that question, where did you go? That question is, how do I meet people when I'm an introvert? Well, I'll summarize it down to that. Um, this is someone who is, is really shy around people, and there's a difference between introversion and shyness, but I, I think it doesn't matter so much in this case. The issue really is the person is uncomfortable meeting people and finds that it drains a lot of energy. It's, it's kind of funny that you're that you're asking that question. Um, I'm, a, I'm a huge introvert. I need lots of alone time every day. I like to think by myself, but I'm actually okay with going out and meeting people, uh, and I've done so by creating a plan. What I do is every Thursday is sort of my at-home to, to the public sort of day. I set it up in the morning so that I'm attending meeting after meeting after meeting. I, I know I'm going to be in Seattle a lot of the day. I know I might be at home some of the day, but I'll be at networking events. I'll be at... Um, I'll be at lunches, I'll be at parties. Thursday almost always ends in some kind of party or another. Usually it's karaoke if it's in Seattle, so join us at that one. But I set it up so that I can prepare myself at the beginning of the day for the kind of, of social and emotional effort that's going to have to happen. If you want to do that yourself, I would, <clears throat> I would highly suggest it. I know that it takes emotional energy to do this, but I also know that you cannot get jobs by applying for them. You must meet people. Your option is to not meet people and maybe build a career as a freelancer based solely on your skill set, not get paid very much, or learn to meet people and plan it to the best of your ability around your emotional capacity. I, I do understand it. I have a question here. Ooh, I'm definitely going to do this one. How do you recommend people uh, do meetups in a more rural area? Awesome question. The question is, or the answer to this is first, start one up yourself. And second, you can do online conversations and talks just like we're doing right now. If you have a more rural area, you can start a more general use technologists group. Um, I grew up in a little town called Silverton, Oregon. And I would be willing to bet right now that if you went and looked on Meetup, even now you'd find two or three tech meetups on a monthly basis. If you have a tiny town of a thousand people, at least four or five people there will still be able to program or might be interested in it. Create your local group. The other part is this tool, the one that I'm using now, Google Hangouts on Air, is a very, very good one for that. It, honestly, Google Plus, it's a little problematic with a lot of stuff. But it is extremely valuable for a setup like this, where you can invite a bunch of people together. Uh, sometimes I do the larger events where there's a whole line of people that are down at the bottom and we're all talking at once. Um, and then you broadcast it, and then there's a video available of it. If you've got a local, if you've got a, almost no one locally, reach out and see about having people join you in a larger hangout like this one on a monthly basis to talk about it. Hell, create the 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 Boondocks Tech Meetup group. I think that sounds like a really cool idea. I mean, there's got to be people in Barrow Point, Alaska, and Silverton, Oregon, and all over the place who would absolutely love to do a a local group that's just for themselves. And that phone that's ringing in the background, there's nothing I can do about it. It should go away in a second. I tried, but, mm. yeah, I can't manage wired phones anymore. I'm totally incapable of it. My husband's got this 10-year-old clamshell, and I tell you what. So, yeah, start the Boondocks Tech Meetup online, because that would be cool, and I would watch the hell out of that. I'll tell you that right now. People will join in, they'll ask you questions, and they'd love to help. Okay, get done with that one. And let's see if we've got any other questions over here. Alrighty, and then the next one we have is uh, oh, child care. That is an excellent question. Um, how do you break into technology when you are a primary caregiver of a child? Whew. It's, I understand that it's tough. 
again, this is the greatest career to be in if you are the primary caretaker for a child. And the reason for that is it works around you once you have a basic set of skills. Technology is the only field that I can think of where if you have a set of skills, like you're a web developer, you're a programmer, where people are totally fine with you working at home. They don't care. As long as you can do the job, no one cares. If you could do precision manufacturing at home, then believe me, Ford would be down with that. There's actually lower overhead for people who stay at home. If you are trying to break in and get your first jobs, the first thing you need to do is find a couple of meetup groups in your area that you can go to to meet technologists, pair off with somebody, and get a buddy system going. Create some accountability for yourself so that you can get a skill set working um, with someone else who wants to develop something similar to you. Do a project. I don't care what it is. If you want to be a web developer, I better see a website up there somewhere. If you want to be a mobile apps developer and I can't download something that you've created on the Google Play Store or on the, the iPhone App Store, then I'm not going to hire you as an app developer. But if you have and it's a cool one, you've got a serious shot and you're way over anybody who just has a college degree in mobile application. I don't know if they can do anything yet. But you, you can execute. So if you can execute, then you're good. Don't execute the kid. I feel, I feel that one. <laughs> execute on your skill set and you will have an excellent, excellent shot. All right. Uh, I do get that it's tough. Oh, and if you decide to form a local meetup, you could, f you could form uh, a local situation and you want to do a hack the people meetup in your area, you can do a discussion about childcare options at hack the people groups to see if there's other people that are interested in pairing up to handle childcare issues. The next question we, yeah, that is a wildly tough one. When there is something about your appearance or your personality which can be, um, basically this is a question from somebody who is a, they're a trans person and they're having a hard time in their area breaking into technology because they, they're, they're not, they don't look like what people expect. First, you have my profoundest, uh, not sympathy because you don't require it, but empathy. And I'm happy to help and network with you in any way, shape, or form. Always connect with me on LinkedIn. I'll make the connections for you if I can. The second part is, it is not your job to tone yourself down to, to fit other people's prejudices. It is your job to appear and to demonstrate that you would be a good team member. So be somebody who is able to demonstrate that they've got the skill set and the personality to get along with people, to care about them, and you will be someone who is valued in the right place for you. If someone is making a, uh, your life difficult, I, I cannot say that I will always understand, but I can say that I will always help, and I promise you there is a hell of a lot of people that will help you as well. Throw an email out, throw a tweet out, and there will be people in your area who will help you and make the connections for you that you need. There are a lot of uh, queer friendly and ally groups that are available online. I mean, seriously, the internet is, has become a wonderful tool for communication as well as the problematic aspects of it. There's somebody who can help you and make those connections for you. And honestly, I do not care what you look like, who you are, how you appear. If you can code and you can code well, I don't care, and neither does anybody else that you want to work for. All right. If we have any last questions, I'm going to check here really quickly. All righty. Uh, I think that's probably going to about handle it for the day. This has been, it's, it's often a tough situation because right now I know that I am providing advice to people who've already had a rough break. If you're trying to break into technology and you're 45, it's not like you had an Ivy League education and you're trying to get into technology after a successful career as a broker. You are somebody who is, like every one of us, who loves puzzles, who loves technology, who wants to make something of a difference in their life and who wants to do something really cool. Everybody I know wants to know you too. And it will be a pleasure and a joy to be able to help you as you move forward. You can create that skill set for yourself. And the easiest way to do it is find somebody learn to practice, get your code online, start taking critique on your code, and then demonstrate to people out there that you can do what you say you can do. And people like me will come find you on LinkedIn and say, hey, let's have a conversation about what you'd like your future to be like. Thank you very much. Have a lovely week. I think next week we're talking about merge conflict, combining family and uh, the technical careers that are available to you. And we'll talk more in depth about that. 
I look forward to seeing you all again. Go ahead and connect with me on Twitter down there. It is at T-A-R-A-H. That's a great place to reach me, and I will answer your questions to the best of my abilities. See you next week, folks.